Well, time for another chat, this time the Navy chat. Our first guest is Justin, who recently submitted his master thesis in military history with the title Blinded by the Rising Sun, a maritime intelligence assessment of Japanese air and naval power in 1920-1941. to So hello Justin, thank you for joining us. Hello, I'm happy to be here. So Justin, my first question would be, what were the main sources and could you give a Brief example for each one. The Americans relied primarily on open sources, uh, which is stuff that's not necessarily associated with spying. So things like uh, translations of official Japanese press releases, uh, you know, random magazine articles, uh, civilian you know, just naval writers, uh, transcripts from the Japanese Diet, which is basically like their parliament. So those kinds of uh, sources, pretty like run-of-the-mill stuff that even a, um, if you have the language training, uh, anyone could really follow. Uh, then there's other forms of kind of like uh, chance observations, which, you know, for example, of a, a group of American destroyers just happen to come across a Japanese naval formation at sea, and they just kind of look at Japanese ships and and note what they see. Or um, the naval attaché, you know, wandering around somewhere in Japan, and he happens to see some ship moving somewhere, or you know, naval personnel, a Japanese naval personnel doing something. So those kinds of just random observations, uh, inspections of Japanese naval facilities. So. The Japanese did allow uh, tours for the naval attaché and his assistant ta attaché and sometimes even more officers uh, to come to Jap some Japanese naval facilities and they would kind of give them an official tour. Uh, this was far more common uh, in the 1920s and early 1930s and they kind of dropped off uh, from the mid-1930s onward. But these were pretty useful. Um, their quality what varied wildly, largely dependent on whatever Japanese officer happened to be uh, leading these uh, inspections. Uh, but they were quite handy. They could, you know, see port facilities, building ways, uh, you know, ships that happened to be around, uh, the way Japanese naval personnel interacted with each other, etc., etc. Uh, the next source would be tours of Japanese warships. Uh, these, this was less frequent, and particularly in the 1930s, where they dropped off. Uh, dramatically, but they did occur. Uh, one example being the American naval attaché visited like a very old uh, Momi class destroyer, uh, where he was allowed to observe a small uh, casualty drill where the where the Japanese basically they needed to fire uh, a main battery gun, and they basically picked certain people that were quote unquote you know dead. So they had to work around that, and the uh, and the American naval attaché was able to follow that exercise. Uh, signals intelligence and cryptanalysis was also used, uh, but they weren't particularly useful for determining the capability of the Japanese Navy. Uh, those tools were far more useful for determining the intentions of Japanese decision makers, uh, which is the other major facet of intelligence assessments that I don't get into at all in my thesis. I focus exclusively on capability. So, you know, how good the Japanese Navy, or the Americans perceived the Japanese Navy to be, not um, what they intended to do with their Navy. Uh, which is, you know, that's all the discussion of like, oh, are they going to attack Pearl Harbor? Are they going to go to war with the Western Allies, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. All that stuff that people have heard about that's in tension, which is in, uh, the other side of intelligence. And, of course, there's also some human intelligence sources. Uh, these were pretty infrequent. Um, the majority of the time I came across them, they were uh, ethnic Koreans or Chinese that were, happened to be living in... Japan, and they obviously harbored um, anti-Japanese sentiment. And every once in a while, I'd get one that appeared to even be a Japanese source. Uh, these were very, very, very rare. And human intelligence sources overall were very rare, and they tended to be pretty unreliable. Uh, there's one rather famous example with um, alleged... Japanese supercruisers, or uh, what the British kept calling Japanese pocket battleships, uh, that turned out to be just a fictional farce and actually led directly to the um, 
the American decision to build the Alaska class. Yeah, large cruisers or battle cruisers. The Americans like to call them large cruisers, and some Americans get very um, antsy when you call them battle cruisers. But they were fucking battle cruisers. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one question about the uh, chance observations. I I read in your thesis that there was one incident. I think it was a maneuver, and they were conducting fl uh, fleet operations with with planes, and then the, the, the American destroyer captain, I think, moved directly up to the Akagi or Akaga um, aircraft carrier to get a closer view, and the Japanese took their destroyers and deployed a smoke screen so that they can't see anything. This sounds pretty pretty aggressive to me and was this something common? Uh, that seemed to be an anomaly from what I saw, that kind of um, proactive posture on the part of the Americans. Uh, a similar, so two incidents that were, that were basically roughly the same uh, occurred. So in 1927, the Grand Fleet maneuvers, uh, a, grou uh, a group of American destroyers deliberately steamed into the path of a Japanese force uh, in an effort to gather as much intelligence as possible. Uh, they did get near uh, Akagi. Uh, its escorts intervened and laid a smokescreen, and the Americans basically just um, gave up and left. They didn't get to observe any flight operations. Uh, again, in 1934, uh, American destroyers found themselves in the midst of a uh, Japanese exercise uh, by complete accident. It wasn't deliberate. Uh, however, once the uh, American destroyers found themselves in the midst of the of this Japanese fleet conducting exercises, um, the commander of the force rather proactively decided that he was going to gather as much intelligence as possible. Uh, the Japanese were not thrilled about this. They had uh, light fleet units, even the flagship of the... Um, force kind of you know, overtaking the american destroyers and just being dicks and harassing them uh and basically once they got close to two japanese aircraft carriers operating together which is already by the way a very um, interesting observation because the americans were not operating multiple aircraft carriers in very close proximity together that was a japanese thing and he noticed them he tried to get closer and again the plane guard destroyers uh, laid a smoke screen in front of their charges, the two Japanese aircraft carriers. Except this American officer, instead of giving up, he actually sailed straight to the smoke screen and <laughs> the landing operations anyway. Uh, and then in his report, which was actually quite detailed, he described the actions of the Japanese uh, and the laying of smoke in particular as, quote, most discourteous. So yeah, that's, <laughs> those are two incidences that are incidents. Where, where the Americans were pretty proactive, but it was not a typical thing that I came across. Uh, I would be quite interested what the Japanese thought about it, um, the action of the destroyer captain. <laughs> yeah, it would, it would be very interesting to see. I imagine they were not thrilled at all, just judging by what the American side of the story was. <laughs> So, to the next question, um, in general, what were the main problems the U.S. faced during the whole intelligence gathering process? Uh, the biggest problem, uh, by far, was just intense Japanese secrecy. Uh, the Imperial Japanese Navy was never as reliant on foreign assistance uh, in the interwar period as the Japanese air services were, which might be something we talk about in another video. Uh, with air power, assessments in the 1920s and early 1930s, the, the Americans often didn't even need to go to Japanese sources to discover what they were up to. They would just go and ask British aviation expert what uh, such and such, who had been teaching the Japanese. Uh, they would, you know, look at basically uh, most of the Japanese aircraft were in the 1920s and such were basically, you know, copies or direct purchases of foreign designs. So the Americans just had a very, very good picture. Uh, they never had that luxury with the Japanese Navy. And the Americans, as I mentioned before, had few clandestine means to uncover the capabilities of the IJN. So based, all the Japanese had to do was not tell them stuff or show them things. And the Americans were pretty much left in the dark. Uh, the Japanese were a bit more open in the 1920s, uh, but the so-called fleet faction uh, took over the IJN in the early and mid-1930s as a reaction to the naval treaties. Uh, 
uh, the, and the level of access granted to the American observers dropped dramatically. And as long as the Japanese maintained a reasonable level of secrecy, the Americans were left guessing based on, you know, open sources, uh, preconceived notions, ideas of national characteristics, uh, bean counting, which is basically uh, just counting the number of guns they have, the number of ships they have, the number of torpedoes they can fire, comparing it to what the Americans have, and then saying, well, we have more of something, therefore we have the advantage. So there's no real detailed technical uh, assessment. Or mirror imaging, where they just assume that the Japanese are operating in the exact same way as the Americans and are using these same, you know, general pieces of technology and the same tactics and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I think I like the term bean counting. <laughs> <laughs> It reminds me what one of my professors said. He said, like, yeah, you can't write um, the history of the Second World War from a trench or by counting tanks. <laughs> I, I love to say that I came up with that uh, term for Intel, but that was my, my supervisor told me that. <laughs> uh, in English, you sometimes see them be called, you know, the, 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 the logistics bean counters. You know, those annoying guys that would come up behind German generals that were drawing beautiful operational encirclements on their maps and say we can't do that because we don't have enough trucks to supply your troops yeah those kind of guys didn't exist in the german army yeah. <laughs> they were sent to norway on a, on some post yeah, yeah. <laughs> well the next question would be what were the main goals of U.S. intelligence assessments of Japanese naval power? Uh, the main focus, uh, and by far their most accurate assessment, concerned industrial uh, and economic potential of the Japanese empire. So basically the Americans concluded rightfully uh, that the Japanese faced shortages of almost everything. Raw materials, skilled labor, uh, naval building ways. You know, in short, the uh, Japanese were incapable of winning the kind of protracted attritional war that the Americans intended to fight. Uh, so the ultimate conclusion was, as long as the American population had the will to continue the war, uh, they would win it through brute industrial strength. Which... So uh, about um, the population, the willing to continue the war, so basically a certain view on propaganda, and I think we know it a little bit from the movies which is usually portrayed the war bonds touring was already in mind of the planning of U u.s officials to a certain degree yeah they, they understood they were basically dealt a winning hand against imperial japan so they knew that on paper they had the the economic industrial resources to crush the japanese and really their only weakness would be if just american willingness to fight the war collapsed. That was basically, yeah, their their main conclusion was that they were going to win this war as long as something catastrophic didn't happen in the kind of the psychological realm. The next thing on my mind, what, what measures did the Japanese deploy to prevent the gathering of information in in particular, for instance, for certain facilities or for certain ships? more on the you know on the low level mm -hmm. um well the primary way was pretty unglamorous it was just they refused to show the americans uh bits of technology or certain facilities or uh, they refused to answer questions that were related to naval developments and things of that sort so you know there's comments from the naval attache when he's writing up these reports for various um tours of Japanese naval facilities and he would say you know the, the the Japanese officer in charge of the tour he would small talk with you uh well enough but the second you actually asked him something about the navy or about you know something military related he would you know stop talking um and also there was kind of passive aggressive uh, moves by the Japanese toward the later parts. Uh, usually the officer in charge of tours earlier on, like in the 1920s, he would uh, speak English. Uh, by the by, the mid-1930s and all that, generally the officer in charge of the tour didn't speak any English at all. So they had to <laughs> awkwardly go through a translator, and it was kind of like a, you know, a subtle kind of uh, F.U. <laughs> from yeah. the Japanese to the Americans. 
they reduce the amount of uh, the Japanese would reduce the amount of information available in open sources. So, you know, Japanese official Japanese press releases would become less descriptive uh, or less frequent. Um, they wouldn't mention certain things. Uh, because since, since the Americans were so reliant on open sources, that was a pretty significant blow to their knowledge uh, regarding the Japanese Navy. And then on occasion, the Japanese would use out-and-out -out deception. So, for example, um, hiding the cost of the Yamato-class battleships in the naval budget by uh, concealing it behind, you know, f uh, a number of fictitious destroyers and kind of skimming funds off of the top of other um, aspects of the naval budget. So they, you know, they take a little bit out of aircraft carriers, if I remember correctly, and other other such things just to cover the cost of the Yamato class without letting the America to their size. So what is your general assessment? What Was the American intelligence gathering for the Navy successful in overall? Uh, it was successful in the sense that the things they needed to get right, so uh, strategic and economic assessments, uh, were completely right. You know, the Americans basically determined that strategically they were going to win the war, like I mentioned before. So that that would have been a disaster if the Americans had got that assessment incorrect, but they didn't. Uh, some other failures, like say the misrepresentation of the Yamato class, uh, were basically inconsequential because the Yamato class did effectively nothing the whole war you know I talk a little bit about that in my in my thesis uh, where I talk about one little fun fact about what the Yamato class or what Yamato specifically did get a damaging near miss on an, a US escort carrier that was a fraction of the cost um, other failures like uh, a poor understanding of Japanese torpedo warfare and night fighting capability uh, was disastrous. You know, uh, you have Savile Island, you have Tassafaronga, even the battles where the Americans quote unquote won. Uh, when you look tactically, the Americans took horrific losses, and a lot of the uh, reason for their victory was far more due to just how confusing and uh, luck and chance based. Uh, night fighting is and also really a testament to the um, individual fighting spirit of American sailors and officers that they were able to basically just make up things as they went along and kind of just through sheer bravado just kind of brute force their way to the near run victories against a, an opponent that was dramatically superior to them doctrinally uh, and in terms of the uh, quality of training that they had received and of course, then radar and things like that uh, came in later in the war. There were other cases uh, where the Americans understood virtually nothing about what the hell the Japanese were going to operate, uh, specifically uh, how the Japanese were going to use aircraft carriers. The Americans were totally in the dark, but they still inadvertently gained from Japanese weaknesses anyway. So that the Americans didn't need to know that uh, for example, Japanese reconnaissance was insufficient. They benefited from it anyway. Now, uh, uh, that's a bit disingenuous, and new scholarship now show, uh, has shown that even American reconnaissance was also equally terrible. So both sides were really bad with their reconnaissance uh, in regards to carrier warfare, but the Japanese, uh, through you know operational circumstances and some luck, were the ones that got bit first. Well, to wrap this up, thank you very much for the talk. Um, for users, if you have any questions, post them below, because if there are enough or good questions, we can talk about them in an upcoming Navy chat. And thank you very much, Justin. Yeah, it was a pleasure being here. And I will do my best to answer any good questions if they come up. And then, well, thank you for watching and see you next time.